be here. So, without further ado, uh, I'm going to introduce Peter Taff, who, as most of you will know, is the General Secretary of the Socialist Party and also a member of the International Secretariat of the CWI to lead off on world perspectives and the situation that we're facing in the world today. Thank you. Thanks, Claire. Comrade Chair and comrades, a word of explanation, perhaps at the beginning. I haven't had a heart attack. These are not nipple, whatever they are. <laughs> they're, they're microphones in this modern age have to be attached to you for a meeting of this character. So you're stuck with it and so am I. Now Claire mentioned Ian Duncan Smith, and in effect, Christmas for us has come either a bit later or a bit early in this particular situation. And while it doesn't immediately relate to world perspectives, I want to have my little Hapethworth <laughs> on the issue at the beginning. Because IDS, which is what he was known at as in Waltham Forest, and also in general, when he was the leader of the Tory party, was referred to... All right, Tom. <laughs> Thanks for coming in, sort of tissue. <laughs> was referred to by Tory ministers behind his back in relation to IDS, it said it stood for in deep shit. <laughs> and isn't that opposite in relation to what has happened in the last 24 hours? But it's not just an incident involving this government. It is symptomatic, in my opinion, of a general phenomena which I hope to explain about the divisions within the ranks of the bourgeois, which itself is provoked by the growing opposition of the masses, above all, of the working class. And it's an indication, which we'll discuss in Britain, of the colossal eruptions of a social character which will develop in Britain in the next period. And the whole essence of this conference is to prepare ourselves for those events, both internationally and in Britain, so we can take advantage of it. Now, on every issue, I would say, in every region, if not in every country in the world, world capitalism is failing and is in a complete mess. In the economy, they're still suffering from the effects of 2007 8 One of the main economic theoreticians of capitalism, Martin Wolf, in the Financial Times, stated boldly that the crisis of 2007-8 hurt the British and American public finances as much as a world war. That was the effect of that crisis. And moreover, in Britain, as a game we will discuss later, in terms of wages and the incomes of the working class, for substantial sections of the British population, that has stood still and has not recovered since the period immediately prior to 2007-8 and will not recover on the best expectations till through 2020 itself. And now the bourgeois are desperately attempting to avoid a new slump. In the environment, the disaster deepens. They can't solve the fallout from Fukushima in Japan. The Paris summit was a complete failure and a wish list. In February, it was recorded as the warmest month on record with rising concentration of greenhouse gases and rising carbon monoxide. Inequality throughout the globe has deepened. And in effect, the plutocrats, because that's what they are. They're not just capitalists, if you like, but a handful of very rich and powerful individuals controlling the fate of humankind, that the wealth has piled up and inequality has deepened. 
As a result, class tensions have been ratcheted up and the social chasm has grown even deeper and wider. Social mo mobility, which in any case was a myth, but in the period of rising capitalism, if you, if you like, was put forward as a road out for those sections of the working class who could take it out of the traditional poverty that they experienced in the past. That has been completely closed off with no opportunities, allegedly, of the new generation reaching the top. Class, cl cl colossal class polarization has been shown in all countries throughout the globe, but, but was particularly highlighted in the developments in the US, in the events of Chicago and Ohio, when there was a little movement there of objection to what was taking place, it was, a, it was expressing the anger of increasing sections of the American working class, and Trump, in reply, threatened riots in retaliation. The political repercussions of this is the fracturing of the political system and of their institutions. In all countries, huge splits have taken place in the major bourgeois parties at stuff. And let's always remember the dictum of Marx. Revolution always begins at the top in the sense that the ruling class can feel the situation under their feet beginning to slide away. World relations between the imperialist powers have been enormously aggravated. As all the comrades are aware, symbolized by Syria, the, the Middle East, and of course the tremendous political fallout of that in the tragedy of the refugees that they've just now trying to solve by the barbed wire fences, by turning De Greece into a massive concentration camp of mud of indescribable conditions in the Guardian yesterday, which put to shame even some of the conditions that were described by hardened journalists and commentators, if you like, in relation to the neo-colonial world. Germany last Sunday saw the enormous weakening of Mer Merkel, mixed outcomes in that election, I won't comment on that at a moment, but in a sense, one of the most important facts was the emergence of the AFD, the far-right AAFD, AFD, which is now the, which is the most important phenomena of the far right, really, in post-war German history, history, where the leader was educated in sleepy Reading, no doubt. Well, we, uh, apologies to the comrades in Reading. <laughs> no doubt it won't be sleepy after we've gone to work. But the leader of this party has called for the use of firearms against migrants as a kind of indication of the increased tensions which have developed. Now this position in the world is summed up really by Trotsky's marvelous, memorable phrase that the bourgeois are tobogganing towards disaster with their eyes closed. Perhaps they have one eye open because they do learn from history if you like. The greatest contradiction that exists today between the working class and the ruling class if you like or the masses on the one side and the ruling class, that contradiction has widened to the greatest extent probably in history between the objective development of events with elements at least of revolution and of counter-revolution, which, which is ripe for revolution and the subjective fa factor of the organizations of the working class itself. Bernie Sanders recognizes this and after all, the citadel of world capitalism with his call for the political revolution. It's remarkable that that could even be said in the US and has found no objections amongst the broad mass of the working class itself. In a sense, this is the dialectic of history. The most important developments so far as the working class movement is concerned, potentially at least, is in the US at the present time around the Bernie Sanders phenomena. The world economy uh, grew growth after 2008, the partial growth, the fact that the recovery didn't develop 
into the crisis of the 1929-33 of a slump, that was helped by two factors. By the massive worldwide injection of credit and linking this to the growth in China. China replaced the US as a market of last re resort and equally a source of investment in other countries. The neo-colonial world gained enormously by the so-called super cycle commodity growth. At least the privileged layer in those countries in Africa and Asia and Latin America skinned off the cream. China, on the other hand now, which is the main engine of growth of world capitalism, contracted in the last period to 6.7%, with some, real, some experts saying the real figure for growth in the next period is 2.4%, but of course with the debt growing from 100% to 250% of GDP. And as all the comrades are aware, there have been two crises, stock exchange crisis in China. We said this was not an immediate world crisis, that it was the tremor of what would come in the future, that if the bourgeois did not blunder, it was likely that this present phase would go on for a period of time. But the bourgeois did blunder, against our advice, by the way, they repeated what they did in 1937, were not advisors to the bourgeois, but in our material, we analyzed the situation and we said the federal exchange in the US, if they increased interest rates, it could have the same effect as what happened in 1937 in the US, which precipitated a major crisis, a major downturn in the economy, which was only cut across by the development of defense expenditure and the preparations of the Second World War itself. They increased interest rates and they've backed away from that now the Federal Reserve in the US itself. The super cycle has gone, which has plunged millions of people back into the poverty that they thought they were going to escape in the upswing of capitalism as a result largely of China. South Africa, we heard on the news this morning of the situation in South Africa and it will be discussed in the next period of the strikes in opposition to the ANC government and no doubt will be commented on in this discussion itself. In the crisis in Brazil, which has had a major crisis, in a sense the, the, uh, the, most, uh, uh, the biggest drop for something like 100 years in production, not back to the situation of 100 years, where we have now the right trying to seize the initiative to defeat the uh, Rousseff, Dilma, and also as a result of this, we also had uh, Rousseff, Dilma, bringing into a cabinet uh, Lula, the former leader of the PT, of the Workers' Party, hoping that would be insurance against the pressure that was being exerted from the right. And by the way, a judge, a minor judge, it has to say, has ruled that this is illegal, so it's not likely to take place. And this is against the background of the Olympic Games spectacle that will develop in the next period. China now has serious problems to confront in the economy. At the same time as they're dismantling or trying to dismantle, some of, and I add, I add that very advisedly, some of the state organized industries, at the same time, 300,000 troops are being dismissed from the army. And they're supposed to be taken in to the, to, to the state organized enterprises. I don't have the time to mention this, but there was a very good article in the Financial Times, amongst many, but this article pointed out that two-thirds of China is still in the sphere of state-organized enterprises and actually is pondering. You know, you've had all these problems of capitalism in the West and you're trying to resort to QE and the rest of it. Why not nationalize a few industries? A bit naive, by the way. Because he makes the point, if a referendum was to take place today in China of the relative merits of the private and the public sector, I suspect the vast majority would favor the state despite widespread public dissatisfaction with state-owned companies. In other words, it's a frozen situation. It's a halfway house situation. 
Yes, with big elements of capitalism, but difficulties now for them proceeding along the lines of dismantling the state sector itself. The position in relation to oil on the world economy, which has actually declined by 70% in the course of the last two years. That's compounded the problems of capitalism. Previously, a drop in the price of oil would have enhanced the position and the prospects for capitalism itself. Now it's compounded the problems. It's produced a crisis of overcapacity, they say, in the neo-colonial world. What is that except the idea of Marx of overproduction itself? It points to the inherent contradictions in the system. And we have to use this crisis and future developments of the crisis to ad advance the idea of socialism, to actually point out the un unplanned character of capitalism in a simple way, of the blind, pl the pl blind play of the productive forces. Only a democratic socialist plan and rationally organized production and distribution for the common good is possible on the basis of a planned economy. Now, a few months ago, the lights were flashing red, showing the problems of capitalism itself. At the same time, the International Monetary Fund was imploring the bourgeois to go in for Keynesian or semi-Keynesian measures. In, for instance, in America, the collapse of the roads. One thought there that the roads now have potholes in them. The bridges are collapsing. The same in relation to Britain. And one of the problems of the bourgeois is to try and force by these kind of measures a growth in production at the present time. The problem is the world economy is like the Titanic, which is heading for an iceberg, but without the lifeboats there, this time able to rescue them easily from the problems that have developed. They're talking about quantitative easing, of using a bazooka. This is the phrase of Draghi in the European community itself. But it will be ineffective in relation to this current situation. And that's because of the huge debts worldwide, which is three times the level of the world GDP at the present time. Nevertheless, like addicts that are used to injections consistently, now they've got, they're likely to try and go down this road like the European Central Bank. And by the way, there are 6,000 European bank banks still under supervision, and some of them are in dead trouble, like the Deutsche Bank recently that applied for emergency aid. Then they floated the idea of new, unprecedented measures, negative interest rates, which is an untried weapon, by the way, of the bourgeois. They will charge you for putting your money in the banks. And uh, by the way, if you then don't go out and spend that money, they will increase the charges from half a percent to two percent for you to keep your money in the bank. If that doesn't work, they're now discussing the idea of helicopter money, of dropping over Coventry, metaphorically speaking. <laughs> Millions of pounds, or of Bristol, for that matter, dropping, or in the poorer areas of Britain, desperately trying to get the working class to spend because they face this problem of deflation. And moreover, if that doesn't work, then they will try and resort to some other measure which has not yet been decided. In this respect, John MacDonald's latest proposal, on the one side, to actually solve the deficit problem within the framework of capitalism, and at the same, same time, trying to whip the bourgeois into investing back into production, that's really Gordon Brown Mark II. That will be discussed in the session on, the, on Britain itself. And why should the bourgeois invest at this time? After all, the world is awash with prof profits. There's seven trillion dollars in the, in the vaults of the big corporations and companies throughout the world at the present time. So against this background, we have stagnation or at best, at as most likely, a new crisis at a certain stage. And this will have massive political repercussions in relation to all countries in the world, and in Britain as well, that we'll discuss later 
in this conference itself. And this has huge implications for us. Because there's one thing, we got many things right in the past. But there was one issue, perhaps in which we were a little bit too optimistic. When we said in 2007 8 with the collapse at that stage, then perhaps it would lead to a movement of the working class in the direction of socialism. We saw a colossal movement, over 30 general strikes in Greece, but not even in Greece, not in Spain, not in Portugal, or in those countries most affected, did we have the broad-based development of socialist consciousness that we'd seen, for instance, in the 1970s, the 1960s, the 1970s, and so on. So we didn't get it entirely right. right. However, we couldn't interpret this in a mechanical fashion. If, for instance, in Greece, the government there would have nationalized the banks, that would have raised the whole question of planning. That would have generated amongst the masses the idea of socialism in an elemental form. What happened in Cuba? Castro came to power not as a socialist. Che Guevara was flirting with Marxism, if you like. But when he was in power, the embargo of US imperialism forced them to take over industries. It's in that sense that the idea of socialism in inverted commas began to develop, and they took power without a party. They developed the party afterwards. In the coming crisis, we can see this kind of situation developing where the attitude of the masses, and let's not under underestimate, the ability of the working class to draw conclusions from their own experience itself. You could see, as a result of the experience of the working class, them drawing the conclusion, well, the last crisis was bad enough, we thought that was an exception, and we'd go on to the sunny uplands and everything would be wonderful. Now, we're faced with a new catastrophe, even if it doesn't drop on the scale of a slump of 1929-33, if it's a new crisis with millions unemployed, with a blind alley for the mass of the working class, that will provoke, provoke a political storm. It's not an accident that Bernie Sanders came out for democratic socialism, although he rejects the nationalization of, the, of, the, of, of big companies at this stage. His attack on Wall Street has been tremendous propaganda against capitalism. For the US working class, this is a fresh idea. No experience of Stalinism or of social democracy in the form of parties. And therefore, socialism is the most looked up word on the internet itself. And this comes from the desperate conditions of the millennials, those under 35, who in every field have no time to actually go into this. And the youth, let us remember, is the key to the revolution that is coming. In the most recent examples of revolution in the Middle East and of North Africa, we saw the role that was played in Tunisia, in Egypt, in the first period as the driving force of the revolution itself. And the second and pending revolution, the outlines of which are there in the Middle East at the present time, the, the, the youth will play a very key role. That was shown in Kasserine and the uprising in Kasserine in the last couple of months where the slogan was jobs or another revolution. It's a very good slogan and a very good phrase to indicate the situation that will develop. I'm just reading at the moment Robert Gordon's book, The Rise and Fall of American Growth. I'm not going to mention anything more than that. But it's a devastating critique from an empirical point of view of the position of American capitalism. Very pessimistic. The game's up in terms of growth. It's not theoretical. But nevertheless, it indicates the huge lack of confidence in the ranks of the ruling class at the present time. And one of the things he points out is the criticism of inequality is an economic criticism because it compounds the crisis of world capitalism. There's no demand. There's no market there because of the attack on the living standards of the working class. And he gives the figure. We're not talking now of the 1% or even of the 0.1% or even the 0.01%. That's the real figure of a handful of people 
of, 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 it was carried in our paper and it was carried in the material that we've used in speeches and so on. That a handful of the rich could be gathered in a London bus and uh, they have more wealth than 50% of the world's population. It also explains, explains the manifestation of populism, left and right populism. And by the way, they have common objective roots in the sense of the discontent of the masses. And therefore, they're not hardened to one position and can be won over. Somebody, for instance, from a UKIP background can be won over to the position of socialism and Marxism on the basis of the developments that will take place. But we have this phenomena of Bernie Sanders on the one side and of Trump on the, on the other hand in the, in the US itself. And I was really amused that a Financial Times reviewer, I don't know whether comrades are, are, are fans of the, um, of, the, uh, of the House of Cards on television, I have to confess, I've seen one or two episodes. And the character in that is Frank Underwood. And the he's the president. And the Financial Times reviewer said he's, 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 he's seen every one of the recent uh, episodes of back-to-back, uh, -back, by the way, I couldn't do that, but I uh, don't have the time, but of, uh, of this particular TV program. And he said it was very difficult to write a critique of, uh, of this program because it was less shocking than the statements of foot of, of, of Trump and of the phenomena, phenomena of Trumpism, if you like. This is a man who's calling for a 2,000 mile fence to keep out Mexicans who are all rapists. And then he expects the Mexican government to pay for it. <laughs> a big section of his supporters in the South, by the way, actually say that Lincoln, one third of them, in one of the, uh, the, the primaries, think that Lincoln got it wrong. The slaves should never have been emancipated. So in other words, this huge reservoir of backwardness there, which we have, have actually fought, it's incredible to see the numbers that it involved. 37,000 in California. Three times the number who watched Everton against Bournemouth in a recent <laughs> Premier League match. Now before you say, well, we expect them, them to get that number. Nevertheless, it is a phenomenal expression of the mass involvement in this campaign. And moreover, it's not untypical. Look at what Saunders said in a meeting in Chicago. He pointed to the American ruling class and he said, they can build Baghdad, but they cannot build, re rebuild Flint, which is a desperate hellhole for workers in that particular area itself. We've given critical support to the candidature of Bernie Saunders. And we will defend that. It was absolutely correct to participate in the campaign. Because from bourgeois parties can come the beginnings of a new workers' party. That's what happened in Greece with the Centre Union, which was a liberal party, a liberal bourgeois party, out of which came, came Andres Papandreou, and out of which came, of course, the uh, PASOK, which has now moved towards the right itself. It was correct for us to participate, and it was correct for us to also intervene. The US has now gone to the front rank. We have to say, we always used to say in the past that the US was the anvil upon which the fate of humankind would be shaped. To some extent, that still remains the case today. Perhaps with China, that is now riven with all kinds of contradictions which will explode in the mass movement itself. Not far behind is Europe which is now entering a new phrase. And I've already co commented on the refugee uh, crisis. But the instability is, is, is general throughout Europe now. now. For instance, in Spain, we always used to consider that Belgium was a bit of an exception, where they had a government for 590, we had, they had the 589 days without an elected government. And many people began to think, this is very good. Perhaps we could do without a government permanently. <laughs> which of course is ludicrous on the basis of capitalism. But now we have a similar situation where there's deadlock in Spain. We have a similar phenomenon in relation to the developments in Ireland in the short term. We don't know how long that is likely to, ha to, to last. The question of Europe we will discuss later on, of course, in this conference itself. But what this uh, whole situation indicates is the way that capitalism 
has outgrown the narrow limits of the nation state and of private ownership. The bourgeois dreamed of a united Europe, of a united socialist, or not, not, not socialist, but a united state of Europe in the past. It's an old concept. It was, there was an attempt to unify, if you like, the productive forces, expressing this growth of the productive forces, forcibly through Hitler, or as we've seen in the attempts of the common market, and now the EU, a utopian attempt to unify Europe on a bourgeois ba basis. They've gone a long way in relation to this, where it's been taken to, to, to a tremendous extent, which shows the edge of, the, of the, the, the possibilities in the situation. But we said it was utopian to try and unify these productive forces on the basis of capitalism. We were attacked by the USFI. Mervyn King, by the way, the former governor of the Bank of England, has just produced a book in which he said that the euro has been a disaster, and it has. It's like the gold standard, which has uh, inherently produced crises in Europe itself. The argument still of the trade union leaders of a social Europe against the background of the way Europe has been used and the way the institutions of Euro are being used against the Greek people, against the Spanish people, against the Portuguese, and so on. And therefore, their arguments that there's, a, there's either this position of in or out and no other qualification is absolutely puerile. What we see, unfortunately, is some of the leaders of the movement not able to conceive of an independent class position that we put forward on this issue. And therefore, we have to face up to this position by stoutly defending a class and an internationalist position and at the same time being opposed to bourgeois coalitions which is being raised in relation to Spain, Port Portugal and so on. We have a situation in Spain today where there is, there's, uh, the, the, there's, there's, there's deadlock. It's possible that a minority government could be formed but we have to see. But our argument will be those left forces should stay outside that minority government, outside a coalition. In Ireland, there's a similar deadlock. I mean, the Irish Labour Party has been reduced to a rump because they served in this bourgeois coalition itself. Our companies did tremendously well in three TDs in this uh, election campaign itself. Imagine, by the way, what we would have been able to achieve if we would have a similar situation of PR, of proportional representation. The situation of the EU is that it's a vicious neoliberal force. We see now the reaction, belated reaction that's developing in France to the Hollande government, where they're now going down the road of more measures of neoliberalism. They've been a little bit delayed by the pressure of the French workers' movement. They haven't gone as far as Britain and some other countries in Europe itself. And therefore, when Hollande and Macron and, and uh, Vallis tried to introduce, or are proposing to introduce, neoliberal measures, including the weakening of the 35-hour week, there's been marvellous demonstrations of the youth on the streets of France in the next period. And that's a little bit of a warning to us as well. We cannot take the situation on the surface as an indication of the mood of the masses at each stage. It can take an event like IDS. It can take one movement of the youth particularly that can trigger off a movement of the working class <laughs> itself. That's the phenomena in, this, in France and also the potential that exists in Italy at this moment in time. And Germany is now not far behind. I'm going to speak at a meeting of the German Comrades in the Socialism event next week, in which we hope to learn about the current situation that's developing. But the success, the partial success of the AFD will now result in a counter-movement of the youth and the working class, together with the industrial situation and economic situation in Germany, will open up big possibilities for our organization itself. Eastern Europe and most of the regimes of Eastern Europe now are inherently sta unstable. If you think there's a refugee problem in relation to the Middle East, by the way, that could be overshadowed by what could take place in Eastern Europe in the next period because of the crisis in the Balkans where there's 200,000 Kosovans 
who could come over the border into Western Europe in the next period. And then, of course, we have the situation in the Middle East itself. And I have to say that on Libya and on the Middle East in general, the CWI has been proved to be absolutely correct. We predicted the Arab, the so-called Arab Spring, the North African Revolution in the documents of the CWI, as is shown in a very good article in the current issue of Socialism Today. We predicted that, but at all stages of what has happened in the Middle East, I think in general, without having considerable forces on the ground, we've been, we've been proved to be correct. We opposed those who said that the Assad regime would be overthrown easily. We, we, didn't under, we didn't underestimate the difficulties that they would face, and there was a genuine uprising at the beginning. But it was not a repetition of Libya, and it's not a repetition of other developments that have taken place. But the intervention of Putin, of Russia, in the situation, decisively altered the relationship of forces. Now, Putin, if you read the bourgeois press, he's about to pull the plug on Syria itself. I don't think that is likely to take place. But let's say he's trying to force Assad to the negotiating table in Vienna. That's one element. One of the factors, by the way, where Putin has come out on top, is restored at least partially the great power position of uh, Russia, at least in the Middle East itself. We take an independent class position. I'm estimating the relationship of forces here. We don't back Putin. We don't back Assad. We take an independent class position in the Middle East itself. But the idea that Assad could be overthrown just by the withdrawal now of Russia is completely false. Because Assad still has the support of Iran, who've newly emerged now through the agreement with America, and of the 100 million Shia who are actually present in the region itself. So this deadlock will not be solved by the support of one major power or another. Only the working class, acting independently, Stepping onto the stage of history can begin to change the situation in the Middle East itself. Terrorism is a dead end. ISIS, from a long-term point of view, they've caused terrible damage. They cannot win. They cannot succeed. Because their, their medieval methods will, it will, will alienate the masses and have alienated them at a certain stage. Nor can a guerrilla war, there's various estimations of how long a guerrilla war can last. Well, Northern Ireland, I know it's not the Middle East, but Northern Ireland showed even with a 30-year guerrilla war, where you're based on a minority, you cannot succeed. It's only by the independent mobilization and the organization of the working class that you can find a way forward. What are the perspectives for the Middle East then? We were correct to hail the revolution. We were correct to warn against the, the role of the military and of the deep state in Egypt, for instance. And now Egypt is like one giant prison house as far as the masses of Egypt are concerned. It's incredible the amount of booty that the military demand of the Egyptian people, which is, which, which they, where they have their own independent factories, their own financial interests and so on, where they actually use it unscrupulously in order to blackmail the state itself. But the indication of what is coming is being shown by Iraq but even on a small incidental issue, on the question of the football, the triumph of Iraq in the uh, recent match where they, 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 they won and they're now participating in the Olympic Games, as a result of that measure, you had a demonstration in Baghdad. It was the Iraqi Shias and the Iraqi Sunni who came out onto the streets and the national celebration saying, we are not, uh, we are not uh, Shias, we are not Sunni, we are Iraqis. And they've done that on a number of occasions itself. In Israel, I don't have time to go into that. We have a particularly bloody situation that's developing there. There's no time, comrades, because of the importance of you getting in to this discussion for me to go into Latin America. But the pink tide has gone back in Latin America. Now the right seems to be resurgent in Brazil, as I've mentioned. But nevertheless, the working class will come back with a resounding movement in the next period itself. I think that in the period that we're opening up, we will grow, not just in the British section, 
But in other sections of the CWI, an extremely favorable possibilities are opening up. But it will not, we will not grow seamlessly or in a straight line. There will be difficulties. There will be revolutionary events, but there will also be phases of the counter-revolution itself. As the Bible says, these difficulties are sent to test us. And a revolutionary organization does have to be tested through the difficult times, as well as in the periods of mass movements and of opportunities to grow. But this new era that is now opening up will see the working class, and particularly the youth, move into actions. Some of the bourgeois, some of the commentators, are trying to invoke historical examples. And they're saying, well, the present situation, in the words of Charles Dickens, in the tale of two cities, it could be described as the best of times and the worst of times. We would say, we wouldn't use that phrase necessarily. We would say, yes, it's the best of times shown by the magnificent movement in the US, by the developments that will take place in the next period. The best of times is also if the huge developments in technology, which is developing while we speak and is developing to a colossal extent, if that can be harnessed for the benefits of humankind, we can move into a future of limitless possibilities. But the precondition for that is to free humankind from the stranglehold of private ownership on the one side and of the nation state and to bring the productive forces together on a continental at least scale. And then, if you like, on a world scale for the benefits of humankind as a whole. However, there are two, two roads through which technology can be harnessed. They can be used for the terrible, destructive purposes which the bourgeois are showing us in, in the, the horrors of the Middle East and elsewhere at the present time. We don't accept the pessimist view. We don't even accept Stephen Hawkins. I'll add my little paper worth here on new technology. But he says, well, we have to be very careful about artificial intelligence. It could be used to dominate humankind. And they're all look, looking through the prism of capitalism. They can only envisage a society of private ownership, of owning this technology for the benefit of a few. We're looking towards a situation where that will become the common property of all. And robots could develop, if you like, a higher level of consciousness. It's a very dangerous idea to put forward. A higher level of understanding, but be collaborative with humankind. It doesn't have to be in antagonism to humankind itself. It's an interesting point that we have to explore in relation to our future deliberations. But I'll end on this note. The 21st century, as the 20th century is being one of revolutions but it's also been one of counter-revolution with only one successful classical revolution in Russia. And we'll celebrate the 100th anniversary of the Russian Revolution next year in 2017. This century will differ in one crucial respect. We'll be standing on the shoulders of previous genera generations and we hope to learn enough to guarantee the victory of socialism and the revolution. This is the grandiose vision which we put before ourselves, which we put before the working class, and which we put before the young people in particular, outside of our ranks, but the youth within our ranks at this particular moment in time. That's a vision that is worth fighting for. That's a vision which is worth sacrificing for, because it will open up the beginning of real human history in a worldwide socialist confederation. Thank you.